Of all the electronic music genres which exist in our modern landscape, there are a few that manage to evoke such an immediate visceral reaction from people as dubstep. Somewhere in the last 10 years, dubstep has acquired the meaning of being something other than a genre. It's more like a ubiquitous oral shorthand for absurdity that everyone immediately recognizes. A shrieking, piercing, overcompressed noise that's played for about two to three seconds in adverts or YouTube videos, enough time for a joke to land or for the YouTuber to pull a silly face or for someone to celebrate a no-scope headshot before the video cuts to something else. Dubstep is not just the butt of a lot of jokes, dubstep literally is a joke being played only so that people will laugh. As it exists in 2021, it's probably one of the most obnoxious, tackiest, and stupid genres of music I've ever heard. And yet, it shares a name with another genre that I happen to consider to be one of the most expressive and eclectic sounds I've ever had the pleasure of listening to. A genre which, when I was 15 years old, opened my mind to the possibilities of what electronic music could be and laid the foundations for everything I've listened to since. A genre which, no matter how hard I try, continues to occupy the most important place in my memories. How did it happen that the thing I used to love so much became the thing I now most passionately hate? Well, that is what this video is an attempt at sorting out. Get ready to be haunted by the story of how changes in the system led to me being musically homeless. This is why all my homies hate Skrillex. When I was younger, I was into b-boying, and I'd sometimes get a lift to breaking sessions with another guy from the same dance group who was 18 and had his own car. That was insanely cool to me as a 15 year old. We'd usually listen to music that you could break to, Eric B and Rakim, Freestyle Fellowship, wu -Tang Clan, a load of old boom bap style hip hop from the US. But on this one fateful day, my mate brought this mix CD of a load of rave tunes. It was mainly jungle, stuff like Dillinger, frenetic jump up beats that kind of pummel you with all types of percussion. But there was one piece of music on that mix CD which honestly had no earthly business being there. And this piece of music, unbeknownst to me at the time, would go on to change the course of my adolescent years. It started with a whimpering echo and cavernous rolling drums with all the high end chopped off, leaving a chasm of space in the mix before suddenly hitting me with this. There was instantly something about this track that felt completely alien to me. I'd heard wobbling distorted leads on drum and bass before, but I'd never heard them like this. It was an ambling, heavy-footed elephant of a beat whose drums pounded behind the bass in such a transfixing way that the whole thing became hypnotic. Each time the hook came back round, it was more transfixing, and I felt like I was sinking deeper and deeper into it. I had goosebumps up and down my spine, and I got that feeling that I now look back on as being particularly emblematic of being a teenager stumbling upon their passion project. It's hard to explain exactly the emotions I had, but basically in that moment I was 100% certain that I would henceforth never listen to any other genre of music ever again. And for the next three years, that was actually pretty accurate. There's a lot of lionizing narratives around the importance of experiencing dubstep as God intended it to be heard deep in the rave on a massive sound system. But reality check, I was a 15 year old living in the suburbs of Nottingham. My experience of dubstep did not come from going to raves. The few that I tried to go to, I wasn't allowed in because I didn't have ID. However, I think there's something to be said for the way that I ended up becoming completely enmeshed in the dubstep scene anyway, in spite of not being able to go to any of the raves. My starting point was a dubstep mix CD called Dubstep All Stars 5. I went through the tracklist putting the names of every artist featured on this CD into LimeWire, which was like a file sharing thing back in the day. And LimeWire was so random. The results came directly from other people's computers. So you often got tunes with the wrong file names, uh, tunes that had been ripped from vinyl and sounded like shit, often tunes which had the wrong artist names on them because people had just cut them out of mixes and straight up guessed what they thought the artist's name was. One of the surprising advantages of getting into dubstep a bit later on in the scene's development like I did was that by the time I went digging, there was already a massive wealth of material to explore. The stuff that immediately appealed to me was anything by Koki. His tunes sounded so evil, like really horrible and predatory. His bass lines sounded like they'd been squeezed out of a leaky pipe and he had all these glitched out effects he used to throw you off the beat in the background. Next came Scream. Uh, Scream at his best made tunes which I would describe as psychedelic. 
The leads were colourful as hell and you'd hear these dazzling melodies being shot out of a cannon at you that would then be flipped and reinterpreted as the track went on. I also soon developed a taste for Mahler's deep orchestral echo chambers. And basically, if you're a dubstep head, you know that Mahler's music is basically the olives of the dubstep scene. If anyone says they don't like it, it's just because their taste buds haven't quite matured enough yet. When they're a bit older, they'll be ready to appreciate Buried A Boy. It's really hard to put into words just how much of a revelation all this was to me as a 15 year old. Something that happens as you get older as a music fan is that you start being able to compartmentalize everything you hear because it reminds you of the stuff you've listened to before. If someone plays you a footwork track, you'll immediately start comparing it to stuff by DJ Rashad. Whenever you hear a mixtape from a new rapper, you'll straight away start thinking, his flow sounds like Earl's, or his beats sound like Playboy Carties. And as useful as this can be to contextualize things you're hearing, once your mind is wired like that, you lose the sense of wonderment that can only come from having no idea how a piece of music was made. From hearing something so alien that you have no way of situating it in your mind, other than just knowing that you love it. I remember in particular, Lofa's remix of The Bug. It starts with this echoey pluck and then hits you with this. I had never heard anyone spit lyrics with a Jamaican patois flow before. I had never heard a bass like that either, that hit like a quasi 808. This wasn't just a case of me hearing something new. It felt to me that this was a track which had been sent from outer space because I literally couldn't place any of the elements of the tune in my mind with anything I'd ever heard before. And yet I loved every bit of it so intensely. I eventually stumbled upon the Rinse Mix CD series and by extension Rinse FM, a pirate radio station where I could hear dubstep DJs playing all their new shit every week. And I think it was when I started listening to Scream's show on Rinse, Stellar Sessions, that dubstep stopped feeling like a hobby and became something more like a way of life for me. Scream was a great producer, but he had something else that came from a different place than pure production skill and made him a true star. And that was the fact that he was fucking hilarious. Hold up, hold up, you ready? We're cracking them. Crack them! How can I even describe Stellar Sessions? It was like, Go into your mate's house for your gas to see on a personal level and your mate is whipping out the firest dubs you've ever heard and he's as excited to play them to you as you are to hear them. Ah, just once. I gotta feel the impact of that drop one more time. I definitely had a bit of a parasocial friendship thing going on with Scream when I was a teenager. I didn't know him personally. I understood that he was just a DJ who played music I liked. And yet at the same time, he felt like an older brother to me. Upon reflection, I can see that a lot of behaviors which are hard baked into my personality now as an adult, from the slang I use to the sense of humor I have, were probably directly influenced by Scream, emulating the way he used to talk about stuff and finding the exact same things funny. Hey, I hate Gabba. <laughs> I hate it, like it could be forgotten about. I don't think anyone would really care, like there are a few people annoyed in Holland. And that, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But, can we yeah. have a round of applause for Scream? Yeah. <laughs> also, Banger and Scream's friendship, what the fuck? That was the most heartwarming thing I'd ever witnessed as a young dude whose only interest was really bass music. In interviews and on radio shows, you could feel this really sincere love that these two guys had for each other's music and each other. Meanwhile, I was stacking shelves at Iceland every weekend and spending every single pound I earned on dubstep vinyl. I also got a cracked copy of Reason from my older sister's boyfriend specifically so I could start making dubstep music. And thus I began what would become a lifelong hobby of making beats. So although I was not in the clubs in the heyday of dubstep, I still very much felt like I was part of the dubstep movement and that the dubstep movement was a big part of me. It was something bigger than a hobby. It was the entire foundation of my identity. Some teenagers get into sports, others play video games. My thing was being clinically obsessed with dubstep. Sounds of the youngster. In order to understand how things started going west in the dubstep scene, you first have to understand what dubstep actually was. And I'm not talking about the Wikipedia definition, yeah, it was a half-step club genre with big bass played around 140 beats per minute. No, you have to understand what dubstep really was. 
In the same way that romantic orchestral music emerged as an emotional response to restrained classicism and rock and roll emerged as a reaction to the anodyne family-friendly pop music of the post-war period, dubstep emerged as a reaction to UK Garage. In many ways, UK Garage was the quintessential late 90s genre. The spirit of the music reflected the unbridled time of optimism that was coursing through the veins of the UK. 80s austerity was over, young people had more disposable income than they could ever remember having, and everything was just so colourful. The culture of UK garage music, like everything else in the late 90s, was extravagant as fuck. Now, don't get me wrong, the people going to garage raves were the same as any other young people. They probably had no money and spent everything they owned whiling out at the weekend. But there was something about garage music culture that led to people behaving super extra. Like, people would go to the rave in a power suit and bust champagne in the middle of the dance floor. It was glorious musical escapism, a sort of public spectacle that everyone in the garage scene collaboratively participated in. The garage movement brought people from Great Britain into a more colourful and aspirational world. And you can see this reflected in the promo shots that artists rolled out at the time. They reflect this off-the-wall, vibrant lifestyle that the garage movement projected. Even in the promo shots of So Solid crew, the baddest garage MCs who were themselves a repudiation of certain trends in the wider movement, there are these residual symbols of extravagant fashion and ostentatious wealth. They were members of the garage underground, but they were also royalty. By contrast, look at the promo shots of dubstep artists which started emerging in the 2000s. And straight away, there's a lot of different visual information here. First, look at the people. From the way they dress, to the way they hold themselves, to the way they're framed in the shot, what's striking is that they are remarkable only in their unremarkableness. They're people who you'd pass on the street and not give a moment's notice to. People who are no different in status or substance to you or me. And of course, dubstep producers make a conscious choice to frame their press shots in this way. Scream's first LP cover in particular has always struck me as the kind of photo that your mate might snap of you as a joke when you're pretty fucking spangled. But there's obviously something in this image of Scream being at odds with a crowded room that communicates a message about his music that he wants to put out there. Additionally, look how much setting we're seeing in these photos. The surrounding environments of dilapidated streets, desolate buildings and battered walls. The framing of the shots means that people are often dwarfed by their own surroundings. And again, this is a conscious decision. The artists are not just showing us who they are, they're, to a much larger extent, showing us the places they live in. And this is a great jumping off point to start talking about what dubstep was. The early pioneers of dubstep splintered away from Garage because they were drawn to deeper, darker sounds. The movement that eventually formed would replace the kaleidoscopic escapism of the previous era with a clear, transparent magnifying glass through which the greyness, the moodiness and the alienation of modern Britain were no longer ignored, but reveled in. Bobby? Bobby, do you think he really did it? The lightning? Dubstep sounded grey. It sounded cold and isolating. It was an unapologetically intense and brooding genre, more prone to make you knock your head back and grimace than vibe like you would in a party atmosphere. In 2004, music journalist Martin Clark, aka Blackdown, wrote, If grime is the voice of angry urban London, dubstep is its primary echo, the sound of dread bass reflecting off decaying walls. Tune your ear right and you'll detect the secondary echoes of King Tubby's dub excursions. Wiley and Jammo's Sinogrime experiments, Strange B movies, Metalheads at its peak, Zed Bias and LB's Dark Swing, Basic Channel's Decay, and Detroit's Mournful Machine Funk. But most of all, you'll hear the echoes of modern multicultural London, of Jamaican, African, Chinese, Indian, American, Cockney, and even Scottish accents. Reflections come off crumbling warehouses, dirty tower blocks, endless row terraces, unhinged night bus rides, skunked out cars, and clattering overland trains. London. This is the defining influence on dubstep. That which gives it its tempered, edgy, compressed character. These are the echoes of a tense, intense city. This is mystical margin music. This is London, 2004. Dubstep was very much a product of its time and place. Following the Twin Towers, the London terror attacks, and the subsequent retaliatory war in Iraq, the atmosphere in Britain was far more grim, and our cultural output reflected the change. 
we saw an influx of gritty films and TV shows which looked at the character of Britain through a more critical lens, exploring the emptiness of what it ultimately meant to lead a British working life, challenging grand narratives about British society and our institutions, and prompting some serious reflection on the underlying soul of the nation. Dubstep captured this shift towards gritty realism in music form. But what was so deeply resonant about the genre was its underlying ability to capture beauty in the darkness. The sound palette of dubstep was moody, and yet the tunes that came out of it often produced these uplifting, transcendental moments that sounded all the more satisfying because they came from a dark and brooding place. And if we're gonna talk about the capacity of dubstep to find beauty in the gloom, we're gonna have to acknowledge the artist who did that the best. As soon as Burial emerged, it was clear that dubstep had found its virtuoso talent, its Shakespeare, its Banksy, the artist that took the conventions of the medium and did something so special with them that they utterly transcended the genre. Burial's music fundamentally changed the way people thought about dubstep, revealing that the mournful, echoey aesthetic of the sound could be channeled into remarkably human songwriting. But really, more crucially, Burial's music challenged people's perceptions of what electronic music could be, full stop. His early albums have not aged a day since they were released over 10 years ago, and still sound like some version of electronic music which has been intercepted by creatures from another world who've tried to replicate dubstep and garage, only to come out with a product which is way too ethereal and otherworldly to fit in with what we have here down on Earth. Every time I mention Burial to someone who knows about his music, I'll see this look pass over their face, and I just know that they've got bare memories attached to his stuff. My best friend told me that as a teenager, he laid down on the floor and cried his eyes out once to the heart-wrenching vocal that comes in the last 30 seconds of Shell of Light. My girlfriend once remarked to me that she'd had a midnight walk listening to foster care, and it suddenly dawned on her that the fading, high-pitched noises embedded in the mix were exactly like the fading lamp lights she was walking past on the street. And in my early 20s, I remember a particular New Year's Eve where we all danced to Homeless on the edge of a hill overlooking Sheffield. Burial's tunes are just so expressive and poignant in so many different ways that they sound like straight up emotions just being beamed out of your own heart. There's an ongoing discussion about whether Burial's music can, in fact, be considered dubstep at all, as it so willfully bends tropes of the genre. But I've always found that although Burial's affiliation to the dubstep scene might be whispered in the genre conventions of his music, it's very clearly articulated in his ethos as an artist. Here's what he said in an interview with Mark Fisher in 2007. I spend a lot of time wandering around London. I always have. Sometimes it's because I've got somewhere to go. Sometimes it's because I haven't got anywhere to go. So I'd be wandering endlessly, getting in places. Being on your own, listening to headphones, is not a million miles away from being in a club surrounded by people. You let it in, you're more open to it. Sometimes you get that feeling like a ghost touched your heart, like someone walks with you. In London, there's a kind of atmosphere that everyone knows about, but if you talk about it, it just sort of disappears. It's about being on a night bus or with your mates, walking home across your city on your own late at night, or being in a situation with your girlfriend or boyfriend, or coming back from a club or putting tunes on and falling asleep. If you're well into tunes, your life starts to weave around them. I'd rather hear a tune about real life, about the UK, than some US hip hop. I love R&B tunes and vocals, but I like hearing things that are true to the UK, like drum and bass and dubstep. Once you've heard that underground music in your life, other stuff just sounds like a fucking advert. Imported. Dubstep was a sick fucking bassy club genre, but it also had something else baked into it. There was a feeling surrounding dubstep, difficult to put your finger on, but nonetheless always present. It felt like the genre had something to say about Britain, about life here, and the way we carve out small moments of peace in largely oppressive, monotonous surroundings. And although not every person who listened to dubstep back then would articulate this in quite the same way I am doing now, I can tell you that this feeling of dubstep standing for something bigger was something we all felt. I hope this gives you some idea of the fact that although dubstep was just club music, Reducing it down to its genre tropes doesn't do justice to what it actually represented in mid-2000s Britain. It carried a specific contextual meaning that was hard-baked into its style and form. To hardcore dubstep fans, this meaning was an important part of dubstep's legacy, something that dubstep needed to honour. And this makes what happened next all the more painful. Yo, 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 yo. 
Brostep is a term which has been coined to describe a particular derivative of dubstep which emerged in the early 2010s. This style of dubstep leans towards the use of melodic Ibiza sounding intros, big, crisp, heavy metal drums, and waves upon waves of distorted, modulated bass lines which frantically smash their way into tracks, leading to a listening experience of absolute chaos. The word bro step was originally coined by DJ Cozzy around 2010 and was subsequently popularized by a spin profile of the movement in 2011. It's an inherently pejorative term, designed to disparage the people who listen to this type of dubstep as bros, cultureless frat boys who've never put in the work that the rest of us did, crying to the last 30 seconds of Shell of Light by Burial. The most popular artist of this subgenre, and undoubtedly the one who played the biggest role in bringing it to worldwide acclaim, is a producer from Los Angeles, America, called Sonny John Moore, aka Skrillex. To say that Skrillex's music was not well received by the UK dubstep scene is quite the understatement. The UK scene hated Skrillex on a deep, emotional level. We hated his screechy music, we hated his fans, we hated the essence of who he was and what he stood for so much. Fate could not have conspired to thrust a more infuriating person into the role of dubstep's ambassador to the world than former first to last lead singer Sonny Moore. And he was popular, so popular that henceforth, whenever dubstep was mentioned in a conversation, Skrillex's music was the default setting of what people thought you meant. And that remains true to this day. Whatever dubstep was before 2010, the way in which the majority of the world identify the music, if they've heard of it at all, is via the particular brand of dubstep that Skrillex makes. When dubstep heads try to explain how Skrillex was able to become the biggest star of a scene where all the original fans ostensibly hated him, they have a tendency of spinning certain narratives about evil corporate America emerging from nowhere and somehow managing to corrupt the pure and beautiful spirit of the UK dubstep sound. There's a reason why this narrative is compelling. It fits with a preconception that we already have here in the UK about what happens to art and culture when it passes through the machine of American commercialism. Like what happened with films from world cinema and what happened with politics and what famously happened with The Office, our British comedy which unflinchingly showed the mediocrity and unfulfillment of working life, which was slowly transformed into a show of wacky American hijinks where all the characters seem to be inexplicably living their best lives through working at a mid-tier American paper company. Why the fuck are they all singing Michael an emotional farewell song? He's the most annoying person in the world, that's the whole premise of the fucking show. However, the truth is far more complex than commercial America having its wicked way with our music scene. And as will become clear, the people who paved the way for Skrillex to become Dubstep's first international superstar are by and large the very same people who most fervently hate him. The first thing to understand is that UK Dubstep was never the orthodox movement that people like to think of it as retrospectively. No genre is ever the result of a singular minded push towards an agreed destination. It happened very organically, often accidentally when art points in a vaguely similar direction. The battle to define what the leading tropes of a genre are is one which is always ongoing and even genre tropes that have long since been taken for granted are prone to being revised if other strands of the music become more popular. If you ask most dubstep heads where the genre started to go downhill, many will point you to one CD which was released in 2007, Casper and Roscoe's Fabric Life 37 mix. During the year of its release, this was the definitive dubstep mix and took the genre in a new direction which was less introspective and more lively, party oriented you could say. At various points, it features tunes with the types of sound design that one can retrospectively look at and find some similarities with the music that Skrillex makes. However, the shift that took place in the UK dubstep scene was far too endemic to be rationalised as the result of any one particular thing or person. It was something which happened on a far broader scale. If you want to understand the fall of dubstep, the time period which is most relevant to look at is 2008 to 2010, an era which I like to call the dubstep nether zone, because during this time, the sound was being pushed in so many different directions that it became completely undefined and amorphous as a musical space. Dubstep had been going for long enough that producers were ready to drastically challenge its established tropes, but whilst there was a shared appetite for change, different producers had very different visions for what form that change should take. I remember when Zombies EP dropped on Hyperdub and how much that record whipped the rug out from under my feet. 
If Burial's music revealed the extent to which dubstep could tug on your heartstrings, Zombie's beats revealed how much dubstep could fuck with your head. This EP was, and still is, one of the most dark and twisted collections of SNES sounding beats I'd ever heard. And for two years, Zombie just kept going making absolutely fucked tunes. Sometimes with lasers, sometimes with wobbles, sometimes with flutes. Zombie built this whole landscape of cursed dubstep music that existed in its own lawless parallel universe. And there were other producers who seemed to be landing on a similar head-fucky sci-fi reorientation of the dubstep sound. People like Iconica who put out this mind-blowing tune, Please, and Becoming Real, who was channeling surrealism in these gloopy, square wave tinged compositions that were sublimely beautiful and so well and intricately orchestrated. Then you had another cohort of producers who were pushing very vocalist centric tracks. Artists like Von D, Bella and Clouds, whose music has always, to me, felt like it has this Icelandic, folky feel to it. Vocal tunes had, of course, always been a feature of dubstep, but post-2008, it felt like there was a concerted effort made to collaborate with vocalists whose ways of singing suited the ethereal, hazy quality that the genre had always had. And the results are some of the most intriguing bits of niche pop music you'll ever hear. Meanwhile, there were other people taking the doom-filled darkness of the sound to its logical conclusion. Shackleton, Appleblim, and Peverillis come to mind. They mainly channeled the droning ambience of early dubstep beats and created a powerful sense of dread over rolling drums, leading to an intense and immersive sort of soundscape listening experience. And then we had fucking my top boys, the Hemlock Collective, who were light years ahead of their time, but still very much anchored to the dubstep scene. The early work of Untold in particular is genius deconstructed club music that is so jarring yet unbelievably satisfying to listen to. And my favourite dubstep tune of all time was one which was released on Untold's label at the end of 2009. A wonky, mesmerising, soulful record by a then completely unknown 20 year old producer called James Blake. And yes, that is THE James Blake, who now collaborates with Beyonce and plays his piano music to millions of people all over the world. The first bits of art he ever put out into the world were incredible dubstep tunes. He is gonna get his own video on my channel one day, I love his early beats so fucking much. However, if there was one strain of dubstep that you felt you could point at and put money on at the time and say, that right there, that's the future of the sound, it would be the music pioneered by a young Bristolian called Joker. Joker top the game, no one's party. To all intents and purposes, Joker had completely different sensibilities as a producer from the ones that had defined the dubstep sound just two years previous. His tracks, far from big, dark and brooding, were glimmering monuments to a colourful and nostalgic past. 90s gangster leads, tracks which paid homage to 1980s vocoder funk, some melodies that sounded like they came straight out of SNES games, and others that sounded like the thugged out version of the Blade Runner soundtrack. But it was all executed so beautifully that you'd be hard pressed to find anyone in the scene who wasn't immediately enraptured with Joker as soon as they heard his beats. And it showed in the amount of artists who subsequently emerged taking inspiration from him. We had Jemmy making the evil Pokemon trainer version of Joker's music, taking the gangster leads and dropping him into what feels like a long boss fight sequence. Guido, whose bittersweet tracks now sound like a UK forerunner to Clamps Casino's early work, in my opinion. And Ghostmutt, whose track Thoroughbred is just like, I think it's a Destiny's Child sample. And these cool as fuck blip melodies which run up and down all the way through the tune, it's an absolute vibe. This type of dubstep which drew its inspiration from 80s era soundtracks and old school video games coined its own name. Purple music. Words which were immortalized in the title of Joker's biggest rave track, Purple City. And there were so many other producers orbiting the purple sound who were so talented. It was pretty mind-blowing how much creative juice we seem to be getting from this one niche sub-genre of a genre that was itself just a small corner of the UK electronic music landscape. Purple music is the answer I would have given if anyone had asked me what kind of dubstep would blow up and take the genre to the next level on the world stage in 2010. But over the course of 2009, I slowly started realising that the vast majority of new listeners who were flocking to hear dubstep in the raves had not come to hear purple music. They were here for something else. 
Now we must address the elephant in the room that I've purposefully left out of the discussion until this point. Whilst there were all these eccentric strains of dubstep popping off between 2008 and 2010, they were pretty much all being collectively overshadowed by another form of the sound which was not just carving out a space for itself but growing exponentially in popularity with each passing month. And the name that we had for this back in 2008 was dubstep tearout music. Tear out tracks were distinguishable for their chaotic energy which they created through hard drums and warping mid-range bass lines. When we say mid-range, what we mean is that the bass lines were specifically engineered to register highly in the mid frequencies, as opposed to earlier dubstep tracks where the bass lines were typically in the low end frequencies, and I can give you a mini demonstration of how this works. So here I have a mid-range bass line. In order to turn it into a low-end bass line, I'd remove all the high-end frequencies from it like this, so that those frequencies no longer come through. And listen to how the sound changes as the high frequencies are removed. It suddenly sounds a lot deeper because the low frequencies are the only part of the bass you can hear, and on a track it creates this cavernous, meditative vibe which can be very deep and powerful when played on a big sound system. This is the feeling that a lot of the early dubstep fans enjoyed, that pounding weight of the bass that presses into your chest. You get this surreal feeling like the beat is inside you, like you and everyone around you are underwater swaying and floating in it. And now let me bring the mid-range frequencies back into this bass line and immediately you can hear how much of a difference that makes. The bass line is a much more potent force in the mix and this drastically changes the character of the tune as a whole. It now sounds really disruptive, it's all up in your ear. It feels like a way more rowdy listening experience just from the bass taking up more frequency room. Tear out dubstep tracks with mid-range bass lines offered a different type of experience in the rave because the fact that the bass lines were so full and fat gave them a dazzling wow factor when they dropped. They telegraphed a clear signal to the crowd, the drop is here, it's time to go mad now. So tear out tunes always got these immediate explosive reactions. Small but interesting side note, there's a language culture in dubstep and 140 music in general of telling people to fuck off when you're vibing to a tune you like. I don't know when this started, but I've always found it kind of joke to think about an unsuspecting person landing on a Khan and Neek track and wondering why their fans appear to be telling them to fuck off and shut up. Very disrespectful. Now, I can't stress the following point enough. If your only criteria for judging music is how deep the bass is, you're an idiot. There's a time and place for every bass line, and there's nothing that makes deeper dubstep tracks inherently better than the mid-range ones, they just have different functions in the dance. I personally love tear out dubstep tracks. When you've got a little groove going and squirmy bass lines popping off over the top, it's a madness. It sounds so sick to me. I get this instant grin on my face like, yes, it's time to go mad. Ever since Koki's tune Spongebob was being dropped in sets in 2007, it was clear that amongst dubstep listeners, there was a thirst for these big tear out crowd stopper tunes where deepness wasn't a factor. Writing for Pitchfork in 2007, Martin Clark wrote, A recent dance floor fave in Chef and Mala sets is a new Koki dub, possibly called Spongebob. For a while, parts of dubstep have been entering into a drum and bass style harder than thou contest, and Spongebob certainly holds its own. The harder than thou camp often deploy heavy doses of wobbled bass lines, a style that Koki did as much as anyone to pioneer. And yet this tune takes it to the next level. Deploying dark, aggressive synths in rapidly fluctuating interval patterns, they overload the tune so there's little space left for other elements, drums, etc. The result, so cold and alien, does differentiate itself from other run-of-the-mill dark dubstep beats. But the question needs to be asked, aesthetically, does dubstep really need to get that hard, dark and cold? And the dubstep scene replied, Fuck off, Blackdown, you nerd. Koki's beats are sick, mate. There's no way this is gonna backfire on the scene. A question which might occur to you, particularly if you're new to dubstep, is what separates Koki's beats from the ones that Skrillex makes? Why was Koki's crazy music embraced by the UK dubstep scene while Skrillex's crazy music was dismissed as brostep? I think that's a really good question because on the surface of things, Tear Out Dubstep and Bro Step both do very similar things, engineering disruptive mid-range bass lines for chaos in the dance. 
but I think there are some important distinctions to be made between the two mutations of the dubstep sound, which help to explain why they are differently perceived by old school fans of the dubstep genre. You'll have to forgive me for speaking extremely subjectively and broadly in this next section. Firstly, there are certain structural tendencies in dubstep production, going back to the early years, which tear out dubstep despite having crazy sound design still tends to closely follow. A big thing is finding a groove and letting that groove sink in over the course of a track. Tear out producers drop mad bass lines, but they leave those bass lines to stew for the entirety of the tune. The drop feels crazy, but after 16 bars, you know exactly where you stand and you're able to sink into the groove as the track develops, even if it's a fairly mad sound being played. By contrast, if you listen to bro step tunes, you'll quickly realize that the people who make them can't seem to settle on a single groove for any amount of time. Every four bars, a new iteration of the bass line comes bursting through the door, leaving only the massive kick and snare holding the tune together, which makes it virtually impossible to find a groove. That's why you see bro step crowds giving up on dancing entirely and just headbanging to the kicks and the snare hits. That's all the track is giving them to latch onto. The other difference between tear out dubstep and bro step is the trimmings which go around the edges of a track, essentially the intro and outro. Tear out dubstep, again, follows the mold of old school dubstep production in striking a tone which is murky grey. The intro is a droning ambience, or a drum beat, or perhaps the hint of a few bass notes from the drop. I think this makes tear out dubstep beats feel like they exist in the same aesthetic universe as the old school dubstep classics. By contrast, bro step tunes strike very bold tones of fluorescent crimson and deepest darkest black on their way towards a drop. Bro step producers have this tendency of saying the quiet part out loud. For example, instead of creating sci-fi ambience, they'll have a literal alien who comes in and delivers a monologue like I am an evil alien and I have a base weapon and I am going to shoot it at you. Power up the base cannon. And like, instead of leaving empty space in the mix so the drop comes with a surprising impact, bro set producers will make the drop a surprise by making the intro an entirely different song. Like, oh, a 90s rave tune. Are you enjoying that? Psych. That was merely a genius trick so that you'd be surprised by my bass line. So I guess you could say that whilst the bass line sound design of Tear Out Dubstep differentiated it from the beats you'd hear in 2006 from people like Mala and Lofa, the structural tendencies and aesthetic of Tear Out Dubstep situated it very much in the same sonic universe as its predecessor genre. By contrast, Bro Step appropriated the one craziest thing about Tear Out Dubstep, the bass line noises, and proceeded to throw everything else out the window, with the result that old school fans could no longer see any trace of the genre they liked in the beats that bro step producers were making. Nonetheless, it is true that both Koki and Skrillex achieved success through experimentation with crazy mid-range bass design, albeit on different respective levels and with different audiences, so I think it's worth exploring what was appealing to people about that specifically. Tear out tunes like Spongebob by Koki enjoyed several advantages over deeper tunes which had their bass low in the mix. The first advantage we've already talked about, tear out tunes were rave dynamite. However, another advantage they enjoyed was entirely practical. You could hear Koki's bass lines on any speaker. You didn't need to be at a rave, you didn't need to be in a car, you didn't even need to be wearing headphones. You could literally play Spongebob out of your laptop and you're still hearing that mad growling bass. It still sounds crazy. If you compare it to tunes like Eyes by Mala, which dubstep heads typically venerate as being the higher art form of the sound, there's no comparison. Eyes sound so weak on tinny speakers, it's like there's nothing there. And I have heard Eyes on a Function 1 sound system. It's insane. You feel like you can see the waves of sound in air. It really is an out of body experience which nothing else even remotely compares to. But most people don't listen to music this way. They have little speakers that come as a package deal with their computers and they are way more likely to be impressed by something that sounds powerful on these tinny little fuckers than something which they are told would sound incredible if only they had the right equipment to listen to it. And it wasn't just listeners but producers who had limited access to the studio monitors you would need to engineer bass heavy music. 
It's no accident that the kinds of mid-range bass lines which took off in tear-out dubstep near the end of the 2000s were very similar to grime music and bass line, genres pioneered by young producers who suddenly found themselves with access to programs like Fruity Loops and Reason, but didn't have good speakers to blast their tunes on. Filling up the whole mix with wonky growling bass lines was a great way of achieving impact with an audience who would be listening to the tunes in their cars, on phones, and on laptops. But although tear-out dubstep tracks like Spongebob by Koki were loved by the UK dubstep scene, there came a point where opinions began to shift on the type of dubstep that went hard for the sake of going hard. I'd venture the reason why the shift happened had little to do with the tracks themselves, although they did get more annoying, it was more to do with the regularity at which these tunes were getting played in dubstep sets. Previously, tear-out tracks had always been held in equilibrium by other variations of the dubstep sound, the electricity of hearing a tune by Koki in the rave came from the fact that it would explode out of nowhere, straddled on either side by tunes which were not by Koki. It was the variation, the way that dubstep mixes would switch up to something mad and then simmer back down to more introspective dubstep that made Go Into The Night such an immensely enjoyable wild ride. But between 2008 and 2010, the ratio of tear out dubstep to everything else was becoming skewed. Instead of hearing three Koki-esque bangers over the course of a set, you'd hear 15, 20, sometimes people playing entire sets composed uniquely of hard tear-out tunes. As I've said, I love rowdy beats, but do I want to hear Spongebob mixed into Don't Mess About, mixed into the Where's My Money remix, then Rock the Bells, then Askeleta, then I'll Cut You, then Serious? No. It's like being tortured with an array of slightly different chainsaws, and none of them end up packing the punch which they should because there's nothing to differentiate them from everything else being played either side of them in the mix. And this is what was happening at the dubstep nights. Full sets stacked full of tear out tunes led to a fatiguing experience where the moments of electricity no longer packed the same punch. What I didn't understand at the time was that there was actually a force outside of the DJ's control that was having a massive impact on their tune selection. And that force was an anti-smoking law which came into force in summer 2007. We're now just weeks from the ban on lighting up in public places, but there's still doubt about exactly which public places will be affected. Pubs, clubs and bars for instance, yes, smoking is going to be banned there. As a non-smoker, my reaction to the banning of smoking in clubs was one of complete indifference. But unbeknownst to me, smoking played a big role in dubstep events. People liked being able to come to the rave, pick a spot to chill in and blaze throughout the night. Experiencing DJ sets in this way, where you stand in one spot and don't move, it's like you're signing up for the adventure the selector wants to take you on, whatever that entails, whether it's weird, deep, ambient, whatever. Effectively, you end up experiencing music as a journey, rather than a roulette wheel which you hope will throw you some bangers. However, the smoking ban changed this dynamic. This is what Mala had to say about what he observed happening in the scene. I think the smoking ban did have an impact on the sound and the dances. For a crew with hard smokers, what happens with a smoking ban is that you have an audience that aren't focused for the whole session. You're getting people coming in and going out, and that was disruptive to the dances because it had the effect of shortening people's attention spans. High impact and quick tunes get the quick response. This really cuts to the heart of the issue. DJs didn't necessarily want to play sets of wall-to-wall -wall tear out tracks, but many of them saw it as the only way they could actually keep people in the clubs during their set. Rowdy bangers pumped the room up and made people feel that they would miss out on something if they stepped outside, so DJs kept playing them. People often think of DJing as a one-way street where the DJ decides what songs they're going to play and the crowd vibes to their selection. But in reality, DJing is a lot like, well it's a lot like having sex. You have your own specific tastes and preferences which you want to try out, but at the end of the day, your main goal is keeping the audience happy. If you're doing something and they like it, keep going. Why would you stop doing something that gives them pleasure? If you do something that you really like, but they're not into it at all, then maybe save those eccentric techniques for another occasion. Your ultimate goal here is making sure other people are happy for the duration of your performance. What was happening in dubstep raves was that DJs were getting a pretty clear yes signal every time they dropped a tear out beat which made the DJs less and less inclined to deviate from that winning tactic. 
and the effect which this dynamic had on the scene was massive. It wasn't lost on young producers that like 95% of the tracks receiving heavy rotation in the raves were the rowdiest beats of the sound, so logically that's what everyone started making. We quickly went from having just a few dubstep artists who were known for tear out beats to having a scene which was so full of dirty modulated bassline tunes that you were hard pressed to find anything else. And how do you stand out when everyone is making hard music? You have to be the hardest. The harder than thou competition which Blackdown had warned about when he first heard Spongebob by Koki in 2007 was coming true, in a way that was far more horrible and tasteless than even he could ever have imagined. As this transformation of dubstep music was taking place, the people coming to the raves were also changing. The crowd of people who went to dubstep nights in the early days were a mix of dreads, art school students, weed smokers and music nerds, and the vibe was everyone experiencing the music in their own headspace, so dubstep nights felt like a refuge away from commercial club culture. By 2010, that had massively changed. Without going into too much detail, it felt like the mainstream club commercialism which dubstep had been a safe haven from had finally finally caught up with it. There was more exhibitionism. Guys who uniquely turned up to hit on girls. People taking video for their Instagram. All kinds of stuff which just makes you feel like you're in some mainstream student night but with slightly harder music on the sound system. And the new fans had come to hear exactly the type of beats which by this point I hated with a passion. Even tear out DJs like Rusko were left with a bad taste in their mouths from the kind of crowds coming to the dubstep events. Rusko is sort of my fault but now I'm starting to hate it in a way. It's like I kind of took it there and now everybody else has taken it too far. It's not heavy metal. I think I've, again, I've been in America for touring for a long time and even more so, they just want it as hard as you can. They're like, Rusko, I want you to melt my face off tonight. Like play the hardest, hardest you got. And I'm like, it's not about playing the hardest, hardest tracks for an hour and a half. It's like someone's screaming in your face for an hour. You don't want that. This is why I say that the change which took place in the dubstep scene can't be whittled down to any particular song, mix CD or artist. It was happening in the very DNA of dubstep itself, with the genre taking on a whole new fan base and signification as a form of music. There came a certain pivotal moment for me in early 2010, when after walking from room to room at a dubstep night for what felt like hours, hating every minute of it, I had to admit to myself that it was over. I'd harbored this secret hope that bro step would prove to be a fad that might pass, but it was just getting bigger. And although it was just music, the decision to stop going to dubstep nights was heartbreaking for me. I still love dubstep. The dubstep nether zone era had been the best time to be a dubstep listener, with so much range and creativity amongst the producers that it was still difficult for me to fathom how bro step had ended up coming out on top. I'd invested all my time and energy into dubstep. I'd made lifelong friends with people through it. The realization that I could no longer be part of a scene that had been my home for the last three years hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt like I was being forced to surrender part of my identity that I would never get back. And that really sucked. When Skrillex emerged in 2010, the rage which flowed from the UK dubstep scene towards him happened not because he defied some unwritten rules about what the tropes of dubstep should be, but rather because he personified everyone's worst anxieties of what we could already see happening all around us. The dark underwater dance hall we once all fell in love with had become a monument to exhibitionism. It no longer held up a mirror to the world we lived in. It defiantly turned away in favor of meaningless absurdity. And the massive popularity of Skrillex was glowing, irrefutable confirmation of the fact that we had lost the dubstep culture war. Skrillex was the cold bucket of water to the face that made us realize that the enduring legacy of dubstep would not be the memory of it which we had in our minds. It would be the parts of the scene which we'd all been wishing would go away and we despised Skrillex for putting that last nail in the coffin. It was easier to be mad at Skrillex than it was to be angry at the ambiguous sequence of events in our own country which led to music tastes changing, club dynamics transforming, and producers adapting to the new climate. Perhaps the saddest and most depressing truth about what happened with dubstep is that the dubstep music we liked, just like every other piece of art, was a specific product of its time and place, which was never meant to last forever. It's just that we didn't realize it had a lifespan until it was over.
As usually happens with a bit of time and perspective, those things that once made me feel bitter have given way to stronger feelings of nostalgia and thankfulness to have been part of something bigger than myself for those formative years of my life. Although the dubstep records I listened to between 2007 and 2010 were not consequential for the trajectory the sound would take as a whole, they were very consequential for me as a person. Making and listening to dubstep beats was something that encouraged me to share parts of myself with the world through art, and I think that impulse has never really died. It's what makes me upload vids to YouTube now. I also remember that the surprise of learning that Iconica, one of my favourite producers in the scene, was actually a woman, was the first event in a series which led me to question some of the teenage boy assumptions I'd had about men and women, what kind of art they make, which itself was a catalyst for me starting to think about society in a different way and forming my political beliefs. And it sounds weird to say it, but every genre of music I listen to now in 2021 has a pathway which links it back to my dubstep years. Hearing Flow Down on Skang led me to Roll Deep, then Trim, then Flirt a D and the whole of the UK grime scene. Hearing Zombie play with wonky beats led me to seek out artists like Flying Lotus and consequently LA beats as a subgenre of hip hop. And the first time I ever heard Joanna Newsom's voice was on a bootleg by 16-bit, which then led me on to discovering a whole world of amazing folk music. People like Sufjan Stevens, Pascal Pinon and Alice Bowman, who've become the soundtrack to my more recent adult years. No matter how my music taste changes between now and the point where I'm an old man, all roads will always lead back to dubstep for me. Experiencing music is such a weird thing because the impact it has on you depends entirely on how it finds you and perhaps more importantly when it finds you. It just so happens that dubstep found me at a time when I was still working out who I wanted to be and so it ended up playing a much bigger role in shaping my musical tastes and sensibilities than it could have done if I was hearing digital mystics for the first time today. I imagine there's a genre of music like this out there for everyone. One which, no matter how much time passes, you still feel this glowing connection to. Dubstep will always be that for me. The biggest passion I've ever had, the best hobby I've ever had, but most importantly, my musical origin story. Yes, yes, if you're still here, thanks so much for sticking around to the end of my vid, I really appreciate it. I want to send out a massive thank you to my Patreon gang whose names are whizzing up the screen right now. I owe them a lot of gratitude for allowing me to be in this privileged position where I make vids based on personal whims and get to make some money off it. I don't take it for granted and I want to shower you all with my sincerest gratitude. If you're a regular Timbar video enjoyer, consider joining my Patreon gang or hey, subscribe to my channel and simply like the vid. That's also something I would offer you my humblest gratitude for. Certain parts of making this particular video felt oddly emotional to me. I think perhaps it's because we're still in lockdown and there's no raves to go to, so it felt oddly moving seeing these dubstep classics popping off in clubs full of people enjoying themselves. Hopefully it won't be too long before we've all had the vaccine and we can get back to that, yeah? You know, good times awaiting us on the other side of the year. I hope everyone is doing well generally, stay safe out there, and I will now love you and leave you in a bit.